Hey guys, welcome. I'm gonna make sure my microphone's not too hot here. Uh, thanks for joining me. All right, so this is an Adobe Masterclass on animation. And we're gonna be talking about Animate CC, of course. Um, so yes, thanks to Adobe for, in, for inviting me, asking me to do this. Uh, it's an honor for me. Um, thank you, Michael and your team over at Adobe. So I'm happy to be here. Just kind of getting situated. Had a little excitement in my neighborhood this morning, right outside my door with plenty of police and fire engines and I'm fine, but not sure who is not fine today, but we're good because we're going to be talking about animation. Uh, and what I'm going to do, if I do anything, Hey everybody. I see everyone starting to show up in the, uh, in the chat panel. Um, if I show you guys anything in the next, I think I have 45 minutes or so. Um, I want to show you just how um, flexible and versatile Animate CC is, uh, at least for me. I mean, I really regard it as a, uh, hey, what's up, Molten Inc. Thank you, sir. Uh, hey, Media McGee, Echo Sith, awesome. Thanks, thanks for joining. Hi from London, Tito Saki. Um, awesome, I'm streaming from my home here in Boston, Massachusetts, USA. Uh, so this is great, I'm excited. So I wanna get through a bunch of stuff. I probably won't even get through all of it, uh, but I do have a lot of it, if not all of it, um, up on, a, um, on my Creative Cloud folder for sharing. Oh, hey, just proud to be. Awesome, thanks for joining. So, like I said, if there's anything I wanna show you, it's just how versatile Animate can be. I'm st I've almost broken a habit of, of uh, saying that word flash. I'm close, 16 years of calling it one thing and now I'm calling it another, I'm getting good. It slips, so if I call it flash, everyone just drink, whatever you have. That's the game, that's what we're doing. So the one thing I wanted to show you guys, uh, and you know, I'll be looking and checking the chat, so if you guys have questions, I'm gonna try to answer them without getting too derailed, but I don't mind getting derailed at all. If it's something you guys are interested in learning about Animate that you don't already know. What I plan on doing is showing you a little bit of like nesting, just showing you a simple ball bouncing kind of technique, um, the traditional way. And hold on, I just wanna lower something over here on my left. And, um, and also nesting and uh, the advantages of nesting animations and that whole concept of placing animations inside of symbols and, and how powerful that can be. For me, that was my aha moment. Um, so anyway, coffee shots, let's do this. I'm with you, Just Proud, here you go. Amo6, hi from Canada. Hello. Um, all right, I'm also gonna show you, like I said, the ball bouncing thing, a little bit of frame by frame. I'm gonna show you uh, the bone tool I did in a previous uh, stream, but I'm just gonna like, you know, condense it down a little bit. Um, I'm gonna show you a stick man technique because I kept on noticing that that was getting asked a lot in the chat. And um, uh, the Black Lotus 92, you are not late. You are perfectly timed. So welcome. Hi from Germany, Lursch. Thanks everyone for showing up. This is awesome. Uh, all right, I'm also gonna show you uh, this sort of two and a half D technique that I love to you know add to like whatever game characters and things like that. Uh, and then some more like cut and paste style animation and even some frame by frame. I'm just gonna kind of pull up some examples and just kind of walk you through it and do a little animation on the side. Uh, so hello everybody. Thank you for attending. Hello from Italy. Katia Mins and Yelko from, I don't know where you are, but you just said hello, so that's awesome. All right, so I'm here in Animate CC. And I just have a blank file here that I've already created, right? Blank, uh, just a regular action script three document. Uh, and Jay Zen already has something to tell me. I have two characters each, a graphic symbol on their own layer. Is there an easy way to fake a camera zoom? Oh, absolutely. Is there something like layer linking as an AE? No, there's not something like layer linking in AE, but you can fake camera zooms. And if I can, I'll, I'll definitely get to that and I'll show you uh, it, nesting allows you to do camera zooms and pans and things like that, which is really cool. Uh, if you have an animation of a scene or something, you can definitely nest that into a clip and then move the clip around the stage with tweens on a, on a parent layer, let's say, or a parent level. Uh, so here's what I wanted to show you guys, the advantages of, let's just say making a ball bounce. I work, you know, I worked eight years freelance and I worked for a lot of clients and sometimes they'd have requests and then often after you've animated something, they'd want some kind of a change. And um, 
the way you set up your animate file and your animations can help with the whatever changes your client may have. It may make it just something that takes a few minutes or it could take hours depending on how you do it. So I don't know, let's just say um, the client, let's make a, let's just create a ball real quick. Just keep it simple, right? It's not so much about the art at, uh, for this example as it is about the technique. So I'm just gonna create a simple little ball. Maybe make it a little smaller. And um, actually, you know what? Let's just draw it because we can, right? So I'm gonna just grab the brush tool and just grab black and pressure sensitivity. Now I want real black, not blue black. So let's draw a better ball than that. Come on, Chris, draw a circle. There we go. I'll keep it loose. I'm gonna keep it loose. And let's say we did this frame by frame because that's what we're accustomed to, right? We're gonna do it like the most analog style as possible, right? Is Animate more similar to Photoshop or Illustrator in terms of workflow? Ooh, uh, if I had to say almost neither, but I would say closer to Illustrator in the sense um, Iori that it is a vector based program. Okay. Um, but there's a whole timeline as you can see down here. And but I would say Illustrator in terms of symbols and, and vector and, and stuff like that. Photoshop, probably least similar. Okay. Uh, nests inside nests inside nests. That's right. Mo. We're talking about nests. So let's say I wanted to have this ball bounce across the stage, right? It's a, as if someone threw it in from left to right from off stage. You know, I might actually create a quick little guide for myself and I can use whatever I want for that. I'm gonna actually grab uh, a color. It seems to be the same interface as Flash. Yes, it is very much Flash. Um, they rebranded it to call it Animate and added lots of cool new features and enhanced lots of other things. So it's basically Flash 2.0 in a way, right? Um, Photoshop has frame by frames. Yeah, you could animate in Photoshop using layers. You could t totally do that. What's up, LC Finch? How are you? Uh, all right, so I'm going to do this real quick, and that is way too thick a line. I want to go to my properties panel. I have the line tool selected. I have a stroke color of red. Let's drop this down. I don't need it to be too thick. This is just a guide, okay? That's going to simulate the path of the ball. It's going to visual guide for me. Oh, and while we're at it, view rulers, because I want to just create a little bit of a surface for me. And go to guides. I'm going to lock that because I'll accidentally move it. All right, so let's have the ball come in. Actually, let's have it more of a an arc like this. And I'm going to select it, hold down option just to duplicate it, okay? And snap it to about there. It doesn't have to be perfect, again. And actually, you know what? Maybe this actually gets a little smaller, but... Well, I don't want to get too bogged down with this because I have so much to show you guys in relatively short amount of time. All right, so this is the path I want the ball to take. I'm going to drop it below the layer that has my ball so I can not get too confused visually. Uh, I can convert the, out, the layer to outlines if I want, which I will. And I'm also going to just convert that layer to a guide layer. So I don't have to worry about remembering to delete it. Uh, once I publish this, export it to uh, SWF format or video, that whatever's a guide layer will not show up. So it's a great way to actually store assets you might not want to actually delete, okay? All right, so if I were to do this frame by frame, and I'm going to try to do this as relatively quickly as I can. So the ball's coming in. Let's actually have it start right about there. And obviously, we need to extend our timeline. So I'm just going to hit F5, which is an insert keyframe shortcut, right? And I know I'm going to be going kind of fast because I've got, like I said, lots of files. Um, and here I'm going to start just drawing. Let me zoom in a little bit for this. I always, when I start drawing circles, I always remember what Molt, Molten Ink talks about is just practicing drawing circles. And I apparently need a lot more practice. I'm hitting F7, which is blank keyframe. It's inserting a blank keyframe down here, right? And I have onion skin turned on, which is this button here. So you guys know what I'm doing. And I'm setting the frames to uh, the onion skin to see about two or three frames behind my current frame. Okay. Circles. Man. Sneaky circles. So up here. Oh, man. I'm bad this morning. I've, maybe I've had too much coffee. Uh, so I'm hitting F7. Up here, I want, because of the you know nature of gravity, uh, the, the distance between these balls are going to get a little bit closer together. Oh my god, I'm horrible. Bear with me, folks. Alright, now it's going to start to pick up 
Steam. Wow, that was a really bad one, Molt. I know you're cringing right now. But you know what? I'm not going to worry about it too much. It's going to start picking up steam right about here. So the, the distance between these drawings for this ball is going to get greater. Okay. Because it's increasing speed as it gets to the ground. Now, there's, I'm going to do a little squash and stretch, but there's something that I want that everyone sort of makes this mistake when they do a bouncing ball. And uh, a lot of times they'll start to squash the ball before it hits the actual surface it's going to hit. And that's a no-no because that's impossible physically. It's not going to, it's not going to work. So what you want to do is have the ball not squash and stretch before it hits that surface. And now that it's touched that unmovable object, now we're going to have it squash. Maybe do one more quick squash. And now it's going to leap off of this surface pretty quickly. So you get the idea, right? Actually, maybe let's move that up even more. Something like that. All right, F7 again, brush tool. And it's moving pretty quickly, so I'm going to remove some of the... Now it's starting to conform back to its original shape, right? And now as I get to the top, I'm very cognizant about this distance between here and here. In the next frame, I want it to be a little less because it's starting to travel up and gravity's gonna start to slow it down. There's a lot to think about when you're doing it frame by frame. It's really kind of a specialized technique. And I'm not that good at it, but I like to challenge myself. And I'll show you some other ways of how I challenge myself using frame by frame. But um, what I really want to do is get to a, the next part of this. So I'm gonna just quickly, you can see how they get closer to, and closer up here. And let's go about here. I, and I want to also be aware of how big the ball was in the first frame. I don't want it to really overall change its volume because that's a no-no. But I think I'm pretty close. And I don't, this is too equal here. I'm just gonna, there we go. A little bit more space. I want it to really look like it's picking up speed. All right, so now it hits this surface and does another squash and stretch and we're almost there. And I haven't even tested this. By now, I would have probably played it back a couple of times just to see if I'm doing anything remotely close to a bouncing ball, but I'm pretty sure I have because this is a technique I do often. All right, so then it disappears. So let's play it back and see what that looks like. All right, it's fine. It's not perfect, but being perfect is often not the point. Um, and let's just loop this for now, loop this so you can watch it. So now let's say the um, the client says, oh, it, it's great, really looks awesome, but we want it to be faster or we want it to be slower. Well, now I got to edit all those frames, right? <clears throat> Amo 6, am I using a stylus or the mouse? Absolutely, a stylus. Using a Wacom um, Intuos Pro, medium size. Yes, I do. So, CBO James, thank you. Um, so yeah, I would not do this really with a mouse at all. It would be carpal tunnel syndrome, like, like you know, I have no idea. So we have this, right? But let's say, let's make it easier on ourselves, right? I've, I have another way, it's an alternative way. Whoops. I'm just gonna select this ball. I don't know why it's... Come on. Just wanna select you. It's grabbing the... Um, Eraser tool for some reason, I do not know why. Oh, it's because we're live, that's why. All right, fine, be that way. I'm gonna lock this layer, create a new layer, and I'm just gonna show you something here. And while we're at it, let's color it in blue, just so we can see it better. No, I said blue. Sometimes I'm having uh, some color picker issues, but we'll get through that. All right, let's just say we have this ball and I'm gonna convert it to a symbol, right? And bear with me, my convert to symbol dialog is always on my other screen. And I'm gonna just give it a uh, graphic behavior for now and just call it ball. Now what I wanna do is nest this symbol, right? And I'm gonna start up here. But before I actually animate it, I'm gonna hit F8 again, which is convert to symbol. If you wanted to use the menu system, go to modify, convert to symbol, okay? And I'm gonna convert a symbol to another symbol again and just call it ball bounce. Now I'm gonna double click it. And you can see we were in scene one, the main stage, okay? Back here where we were. And if I double click the symbol, I get brought to uh, edit mode for this symbol, okay? 
So we're inside of here, and now I want to actually make the ball bounce inside of here. So I have my ball symbol that I originally created. If we go to properties, we can see it's named ball. And I'm working, I think, at 24 frames per second. So I think this will take about a second or so to bounce up and down. Maybe, yeah, let's just go to 24. And I'm going to hit F6, which is insert a keyframe. Okay. So now I have basically a 24 second, or 24 framed long animation that lasts a second. But there's no animation yet because I haven't done anything other than I've created, I want this to loop. It's going to drop down and, and come back up, right? So now I'm going to go to the middle frame here. And here I'm going to hold down shift and drag this down to the bottom. So now I've got sort of an animation, right? And in this keyframe, it's in the original position. In this keyframe, it actually goes down and then goes back up again. So I'm going to just quickly create a classic tween, right? I selected, I, I highlighted an area across uh, that spans this side in between these two keyframes. And in between these two keyframes, I said, all right, let's just create a, uh, a classic tween. And it applies to both. Uh, the other way to do it that I used to do this all the time is just go here, right click over any one of these frames, create classic tween, and then do it again. But then I realized, oh, I can just select, make a selection across them all and just hit classic tween and it does it for me. So now we have an animation, right? Because, no we don't. I lied. I did something where, uh, I must have copied a frame inadvertently. Let's do that again. I've done this a thousand times and I messed it up live, of course. Uh, so here, here we have a very robotic animation because tweening interpolates motion over time in a very, you know, uniform way, right? But we want to simulate gravity. So an easy way to do that, uh, since we're starting up here, it's going to gradually pick up speed. So we want to ease in. So we select any one of these frames that has the classic tween, and I'm going to say ease in. So now if we just jog through frame by frame, you can see how it increases speed as it gets back down to that surface here on the ground. And we want to do the opposite here uh, on the second half and just say ease out. So now that looks a little bit real. I'm not going to bother doing any squash and stretch because I don't want to waste time doing that because I want to show you what I can do now. So I have this nested animation of a ball bouncing up and down. And here's the animation here. I just went back out to my main stage. If I click and select this symbol, this is the ball bounce symbol. If I double click it, we're back inside that motion tweened animation, right? Do uh, Gigi Gluttony, do I know of any talented artist that streams drawings on iPad Pro? Oh, I bet you there's somebody here who's done it at least once, but I don't know offhand. I'm sure someone does, maybe one of the mods. Oh yeah, Molten Ink is already way ahead of me. Awesome. Uh, so back out on the scene, the main scene, my main timeline. I'm gonna extend out the timeline a bit more. I can now position this ball outside the stage. Let's move that over a little bit. And so now all I've done is repositioned it, right? It's in a totally new position, just doing the same thing it's told to do. Graphic symbols will loop on the main timeline, as you see here. You can select the symbol and then open up properties, and you'll see for graphic symbols, you have a looping option. And you can tell it to play once or stay on a single frame. You can do whatever you want. But I like this. For this, obviously, we want it to loop. So now what I'm going to do is apply a motion tween to it. And I'm just going to right click over it and say create motion tween and position my playhead somewhere at the very end. And I'm going to hold down shift and drag this to the other side. Now when we play this back, we've simulated the same exact animation that we drew by hand earlier, right? And now if the client says, you know what, we don't like it, we don't like the color and we think it just goes way too slow. I can just grab this leading edge here on the right side of my tween span and let's knock that back a little bit and now we'll see that it moves a lot faster. All right? So now we can, or if they say it just moves not slow enough, we can drag that out even further and it's going to bounce a lot more times. So it's easy to edit a nested animation in this sense and if we had to because they said they hate the color, we can just click down in edit mode until we get to that original art. And let's just say they want green, we can change it to green. Go back out to the main stage, and that gets updated. So it takes seconds to edit something like that. So a lot of times with animate and, and doing animation, it's basically the setup. It's all in the setup for a lot of things. But it doesn't have to be that way, but that's definitely one way of working And a lot of animate animators set up characters and rigging and stuff like that for you uh, uh, in this way. Uh, because sometimes we'll actually work with other animators too, so we want us to definitely share stuff like that. So I'm going to actually save this out. 
into the shared folder that you guys will be able to get access to. I don't know, I think Adobe might have tweeted out the link to it. Uh, but if not, we'll get it to you at some point, okay? Adobe Masterclass, and there's a ball bounce folder, and this is going straight in it, right there. All right, any questions on that, on the whole nesting thing? I'm gonna show you way more advanced uses of nesting. Can cut the music, please. Is it too loud? We can definitely lower it a bit here if it's uh, getting in the way. I have to work with music, man. It's just the way I am. Um, all right. So actually, let's move on to the bone tool here. And I'm going to show you my first step. And you guys are going to get all the s different steps in individual uh, animate source files if you want to use this to learn, to continue animating with, um, however you want. Hey, Theater Geek, how are you? Davidius, I want to learn to make two-thirds slide outs. Fade in easy, but sliding is not for me. Two-thirds slide outs. I'm not sure what you mean exactly. Uh, you can feel free to explain a little bit more in detail as to what you're talking about. If you're talking about, you know, um, motion graphic type stuff or characters. All right. Um, all right, cool. So here's what I want to do is, is experiment more with the bone tool. Lower thirds, I think he means like nameplates oh all right that yeah we could probably talk about that in a different stream or something like that i just don't want to get too derailed here so here's my my skeleton i figured hey what's more appropriate than uh, a skeleton for a bone tool uh demonstration right oh i see what you're saying like name yeah like stuff flying out with a little bit of uh squash and stretch fine we can do that actually that's pretty pretty quick and easy sometimes let's actually if i keep it really simple and you wanted to do something like a this was a nameplate of some kind. And let's bring this down a little bit. Maybe it's a little bit bigger. Uh, and I'm going to convert it and call it nameplate, convert it to a symbol. And it now every symbol has its own number of layers and frames as well. So a lot of times I'll create graphics like this um, inside a symbol because then I can layer it. And I don't like, obviously that's not gonna work, green on green, so let's just make it white for now. So let's say this is my nameplate. And I wanna position it, let's make this actually a little bit longer. Something like that, and let's put it here. I like working backwards, right? Get it in position first, and then we're gonna animate it in. So let's just say on frame 30, and actually for motion graphics, I sometimes will go to 30 frames per second, just make it a little bit slicker. Uh, I'm going to back this off. I'm holding down the shift key to constrain it along that axis, right? Bring it to about there. And I'm going to duplicate this keyframe. And let's have it, I don't know, for 10, 10 frames right now. Uh, it seems fine. We can always edit that later if it's not fast enough or if it's too slow. Create classic tween. So it's going to slide in like this. But I want a little bit more, I don't know, let's have it ease in. So it comes in fast and then hits like that, right? Let me blow that up a bit. Like that, but let's add a little bit more, I don't know, life to it. So let's, uh, maybe it flies in. Here's the ending keyframe as well. Let's add classic tween to that and say ease out. But I'm gonna go back one keyframe here and just bump it over a few more pixels. So it bounces back, right? You could do something like that, and maybe that's too quick. So let's extend that out a little bit. So you can get that kind of effect going. So it's a little bit of easing using that hot text slider, easing in and easing out, and just playing around with the position and these three keyframes, really kind of simple. And if you actually really wanted to, you could have it come in, bounce back, and let's actually add another keyframe here, a little bit closer. And I actually have it bounce back a little bit more. Classic tween again. So it does more of like a bounce, right? And then, I don't know, that kind of works for me, right? I hope that's what you sort of meant, okay? Uh, so if streaming, I want to see my Twitter and social icons with account name slide out from the stop, then slide back in, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, you could totally do that here. And, and I think with, um, it could be an animated gif or something like that right no it's fine that would that didn't take up too much time all right so anyway yeah it is it's like it's hitting a wall 
adding like this is great for drop down menus. You can I oftentimes I'll use animate. I work at a game company and oftentimes I'll use animate to uh, prototype out what how a menu would fly out or how icons would fly out and then send that to the programmers. And so they get a visualization of what I want and then they can actually replace that with code or sometimes uh, whatever, you know, it's just, it's a great prototyping tool. All right, so anyway, so let me go back to here. So this was my original drawing, just as it was like literally a sketch where I was grabbing the brush and a pretty small brush and just sketching bones and stuff like that, like this, just keeping it loose. Sometimes I'll do this, I'll, sometimes I'll start on paper, right, and just draw stuff. Uh, so that was the very first step. And I purposely didn't bother redrawing the arms and legs because I know once they're been converted to symbols, I'm just going to duplicate them, flip them horizontally, and reuse them, okay? Yeah, I am kind of fast, a little faster today than normal because I know I'm a little bit limited with time. It's already almost 11.30. I haven't gotten to nearly anything. So let me jump ahead. I want to show you guys a couple of things. Here's the, the skeleton. Everyone asked about the bone tools. This is what I want to show you. So the next step was converting everything to symbols, right? Again, graphic symbols and having it all set up like this. Uh, again, I did one arm and then I just duplicated it and I went up to modify, transform and flipped it horizontally, created that arm, did the same thing for the leg. All right, and so now in step three, I do something that's sort of a homegrown tip that's not exclusively mine. I think probably some other people do this, maybe especially in 3D programs, okay? Well, my name is Keith Framer. Um, so what all these things are, these red dots help because if I double click it, all it is, is another symbol and it's called null. You can call it whatever you want. I just like to call it null. Um, that's just an extra symbol because when you're taking the bone tool, right? And you start linking things together. I'm just clicking and dragging where they're gonna hinge and you get here. There's a way to play around. It, you can see how I can animate that already, but there's a way to in, uh, select individual bones and edit them and control their speed and control how much they constrain. But you can't for the hand because the hand doesn't really have its own bone. This bone does, but the hand doesn't. But if I then create this sort of extra bone and link to that, now the hand does have its own constraint, okay? Or right, once I apply that. So that's why I create that. And I'm not worried about, oh, now you have red dots at, you know, at the end of every limb. Uh, because we can get rid of that later and I'll show you. I'll show you how. So here he is all fully rigged. The, the root bone is here and I branched out from here. In fact, why don't I just quickly go back to the previous step. Well, you know what, I'm gonna keep on going. You guys get it. Um, and so I can now start moving everything around and animate has, has kind of kept everything in uh, an armature layer automatically. It kind of converts all of this into an armature layer. And I can go and hit F5 somewhere down the timeline and insert these frames and position my keyframe somewhere. And if I go and move something, it gets animated and automatically there's a keyframe created for you. So you can start to pose him and do fun stuff like this, right? All right, so that's what that does. Having these here allow you to do things like this and control that bone and, and apply sort of a customization to it. So in the next step, I applied constraints. Okay. Uh, by doing that, if you select a bone, you can you can constrain it by selecting constrain in the properties panel. Remember, the bone itself has to be selected, not the symbol. You have to literally go in, select that bone, enable constraints, and then from here you'll see this. It's really hard to see. I want to try to zoom in as much as possible. You see this little graphic here that it basically tells you how much it's being constrained and I can use these hot text sliders and you'll see how that gets updated and it's showing me how far this bone can rotate what its limit is and if I zoom back out I can move this bone I'm gonna hold down shift and holding down shift will constrain the rotation to this bone and any child bone it has so you can see where it gets stopped so you can prevent this from going too far let's say okay but there's another really cool bone trick that I want to show you guys that not a lot of people know about. All right, and it's this really fun thing called speed. Can I import vectors too? Yeah, absolutely. You could draw, you could start off entirely um, Roger Rockwell in Illustrator and import all that. In a lot of times that happens. I'll work for clients where I'm supplied uh, artwork and it's an Illustrator file and I have to bring it into uh, Animate. It is a little bit like rigging in Maya. Of course, Maya, um, 
to Asian one is a lot more powerful because it's, you know, it's because it's Maya. Um, so what I want to do is this. I want to start from scratch with the whole. Let's, let's just select this for a second and see if I can just go new, paste that in. All right, so I'm going to just create a, an armature again, just to show you. 11.30, we're doing all right. Probably have to fly through a lot of stuff after this. But so when I grab the child bone here, my little null point, uh, everything moves at the same rate, okay? But let's say I don't want that. Let's say I want this to really feel like uh, an arm where it gets heavier towards the root bone or the parent bone. Speed is what you want. Select the bone and then wait inside of properties. You have this crazy fun little speed. I almost think they should have named it weight because it feels more like a weight thing, a weight feature. At 100, which every bone is by default, it, they're just going to move freely like I just showed you. But if I want, I can go as low as zero. And if I do that, this parent bones it shouldn't even move. Usually it doesn't. But I'm going to actually go to about 10. And this one, I'm going to go to about 50. And I'm going to leave this one alone. So now when I grab it, that parent bone actually moves a little too slow. So I'm going to go 25, let's say. I actually feel weight to this. And it's really great for posing. It just feels better and it makes it actually easier. It's not this unwieldy uh, armature that's like going all over the place. I can actually grab this and it feels like this has a lot more weight than this one. And this one has a little more weight than that one. So as it gets down to the child object, uh, it just feels better. It's really, really great. So play around with that feature specifically when you're using bones, it can help you tremendously. Um, and so here was the actual animation. I was gonna play it. Uh, this is how, you know, kind of flexible you can be with the bone tool, no pun intended, I guess. Hey Chris, will you show us some example of effects such as explosions, flames, or whatever else? I can show you, uh, yeah, like Bolt said, it's, that's, that's a whole, that could be tonight. I stream again um, in, oh, six and a half hours. Um, and I actually was planning on doing stuff like flames and rain. I can even show you a little bit of rain right now. So you get the idea. You guys will have access to all of these. All of those files. So, but what I want to actually show you now, why don't I actually go to rain since someone did ask about it. I'll just quickly show you this. So with rain, I started off with these two symbols. All right. I created this with its radial gradient. It's just a shape that I created using the shape tool. And it's got this radial gradient in it that looks like this. And then I just created this circle, which is just a stroke, which is back here. And then from there, if I actually open up the animation file, which you guys will have access to, you can kind of see how this all came together. If I play it, uh, I use those two assets to create this rain effect. Okay. Yeah, Molt's right, man. It's great for tails, um, animating tails and stuff like that, using that, that speed. I always want to call it weight. For me, that's that should be the name. Uh, but it's called speed, which is fine too. Uh, so I'm going to show you what these are. So in so here's the background, of course, which is not that important. It's just a linear gradient, okay? I want to be that limber. Yeah, tell me about it. Um, I have three symbols in here. I'm going to turn off a couple. Inside of these symbols, again, this is a perfect example of nesting and the power of nesting. I'm going to double click, and you can see I've edited... I've entered edit mode for this. This is just a, a little bit of a looping animation where I took this object here that I created, the actual raindrop. It's all elongated to sort of suggest that it's really coming in uh, at a speed that I'm not really animating. It's kind of implying a little more speed than it has. Okay. And then it, it, I just classic tweened from point A. Let me just turn off one of these so you can actually see the whole thing. I'm sorry it's a little small. But it gets to here, and then inside of this symbol, if I zoom into that, you'll see what happens. It's just going to play out, this, this symbol on this layer. It just, it's just a couple of little tweens where I take that stroked circle and emotion tween it. And with classic tweens, if I select it, you can also classic tween properties such as brightness tint, and in this case, alpha. So I can have, have it alpha out at the end, like that. And I just use scaling, right? So we could actually make this uh, bigger. And this is just the same symbol that gets reused and reused throughout. So whatever changes I make here are going to reflect 
overall. So let's just really exaggerate it. And if I go back, that same ripple effect is used in here all the time. So you can see how it changed a little bit. It got a little bit bigger. So now back here, so what that was, was a symbol in my library, okay? Raindrop animated, that's what it looks like. And I have it all self-contained and nested and it's great. It's inside of here. If I copy this, create another layer and paste it in, I could even scale it all down. So all of those now will be a little bit smaller Okay, and now they're all, obviously it doesn't look realistic because it's happening at the same time because they're all starting at the same frame. And you can change that. This is the great thing about graphic symbols and it's why animators use graphic symbols a lot. Movie clip symbols were meant to be targeted, are meant to be targeted with action script, um, but they don't have the, the same looping options, okay, that graphic symbols do. So this is set if I select it, loop, look at my looping options. It's set to start on the first frame at 35. So is the other symbol, right? Because I copied and pasted it, so it's going to have the same character or properties. Uh, if I say, you know what, I want you to start at one, it's going to start on a different frame inside that nested symbol. So now I can, you know, then create yet another layer, paste another one in. And since it's on a layer below all the other ones, I want to shrink it or scale it down a little bit more. Maybe move it up like that. And definitely change the first frame so it starts on 68 so they all start differently so it kind of randomizes it and if we really wanted to be particular about this we can actually take this and since we've basically pushed it back further in distance which doesn't exist we can imply distance by going to brightness and it's going to apply a brightness or a darkness however you want or you can even say you know what tint and go to black and use the slider to adjust how much. So it looks like it's, it's pushing this whole symbol back. It's adding more depth visually. So that's a great um, example of, you know, creating an effect like this. It's a very stylized effect. It doesn't look exactly like realistic rain, but it's good enough. I mean, I like that style anyway, all right? Uh, for heavy rain, would you change anything or just multiply the drops? You could totally, you could totally change the number of instances you use so it just feels more like a wall of rain that's probably the easiest way if you had to you could go into this symbol and shorten um some of these tweens here uh let me see the frame rate i'm at 30 you probably don't want to go much more than that um all right so we're getting down the wire here time wise i knew this was going to go by fast uh here's another example of just doing something uh more frame by frame ish you can see if i turn off all these layers uh, I just have a background with some simple objects. I have a, uh, a shadow, right? And so if I play this out, this is for a game I created with my friend David Crawford. It's a ninja game where you fight ninjas, and the ninja, if you hit a special key, uh, the ninja pulls out this bunny, and uh, he throws it, and it kind of distracts all the enemy ninjas, and then the bunny explodes, killing a lot of uh, the enemy ninjas with him. Um, anyway. It's in my book, uh, How to Cheat in Flash CC. Uh, the whole, the entire chapter devoted to how we made that game, including all the source files, so it's fun. Uh, so this literally was something where I have the entire bunny all in one layer with different symbols, and I'm just literally keyframing it. Whoops. Let's just want one keyframe. Uh, taking it, and we don't want to move the shadow right now. Positioning it in different ways free transform tool which is Q on my keyboard and just moving things and turning on onion skin so you can see how I was just basically uh, doing that manually sometimes I'll just do a manual animation like that so you can see the individual frames it's really quite simple there's a little bit of squash and stretch in there uh, so that's another technique of doing it I never understood motion tweens when they were introduced. Why would you use them instead of a classic tween? Oh, that's a great question, Twilight Jetty. Uh, Animate used to have only one kind of tween way back in the day. Um, it was just called motion tween. And during, I think it was the uh, CS5 pre-release, they uh, enhanced it. They made it better and they called it a motion tween. Uh, same name. Um, but what happened was, and it, what it is... That motion tween is what is still called the motion tween today. What I was showing you in, let's say here, the classic tween is what we only had back in the day. Um, 
what they did was they created a whole new workflow where uh, so the, the, I'm getting confusing. The main difference between classic and motion tweens is that classic tweens are frame based and motion tweens are object based. You apply that motion tween to the object on the stage. And then from there, you have all these cool, powerful features. Uh, but one workflow it broke was controlling the nesting of what is inside those symbols like we can with rain like i just showed you right going here and then selecting what frame it starts on it broke that whole feature and it broke that whole model uh which was kind of bummer it was a very big bummer for animators so when we told adobe hey that this is great there's so many cool new things that you can do you can it, basically with motion tweens you can animate individual properties where Classic tweens being frame-based, you only can animate one property per tween, and that's it. That's another main difference. But um, I could probably do a whole one of my three-hour uh, Adobe Tweet sessions on just the motion tween itself because of what you can drill down and, and get to those individual properties and, and do lots of cool things, especially with paths and stuff like that. So Adobe said, all right, we realized we could just bring back the old tween and call it classic tween. So that's why we have two tweens, and I, I agree it's a little confusing for the, the newcomer, okay? Um, all right, so anyway, I've shown this before. This is how I rig characters, okay? And this is just a character of my daughter that I've, I've showed uh, a thousand times. Uh, but I, I still think it's one of the best examples. So she is a character, right? And a symbol. And everything is in there, in this one symbol. And you can see she, her name is Andrea. And if I double click it, now we're starting to get down into the nitty gritty of it all. Um, so this is where... I create keyframes and do a lot of the general poses and motions of her acting out body-wise. Her head is all one symbol. I can move that around and decapitate her basically, which is a dark thought. And sometimes I feel like, anyway, this is just classic tweens. And what I've done is selecting each one, I've hinged everything, right? Before I even start animating with classic tweens, I'll grab the symbol and position this white dot, which is the rotation point for every symbol, and place it where I want these things to, to hinge naturally, okay? All right. So from here, these are all like the basic body poses and whatever gesture she's doing, like I said. the You'll see that she starts to blink and she's talking and she's doing a lot with her head and she has this sort of two and a half D effect that's going on with her head. Not only have I nested her head, but I've actually created um, kind of like a dual level of animations going on at the same time, okay? So what I mean by that is here on this level, if I shut everything else off and just keep her head, I'm rotating her head. I'm going from here let me find a better set of keyframes that shows what I'm talking about. Yeah, here. From here to here. I'm rotating it. That's all. It's hinged here, and it's just doing this. But how do I achieve that 2.5D effect, uh, which is great for games? And I'll show you another example in a second. Well, here, if I double-click her head, now we're like three levels down inside her head. Uh, I'm doing this sort of parallax movement. Every single one of these objects that comprise her head, all of these curls and her hair and the bow and this and all these things are just individual symbols on individual layers okay let's undo that because that'll just break everything and what I we're using classic tweens I just move things I slide things across and I use skewing and so when she moves her head at the same time back out on the parent timeline I'll also rotate it so you get this really cool effect where it's turning in space and then rotating at the same time all right it's kind of more of an advanced thing. It could take like another, I don't know, hour or two for me to really like start from scratch and really show you the ins and outs of that. But then maybe that's something we do uh, in a different stream. What I want to show you is another simplified version of that. Let me open up a couple of files here. So here's a good character that's set up literally. I set design and set this character up with this in mind. Okay. All of these guys are symbols on different layers. And I know I want to create this effect. It was for a game called Sausage Kong. Uh, Tebow Imbert, if you're watching, this is a blast from the past. Uh, a good friend and uh, an Adobe guy. Um, we kind of, on the fly through email, did a game using Animate. Anyway, we had falling pigs or flying pigs. And uh, a boy had to catch them and throw them in a meat grinder to make sausage. You had a minute to make as much sausage as possible. 
It's kind of a gruesome game. And we had sick pigs, and the boy had to avoid the sick pigs, or else he got stuck. He was feeling sick for like a minute. Uh, anyway, I should resurrect that someday. Um, yeah, and in 15 minutes, Molten Ink is... Oh, yeah, stay tuned for Molt. Stay tuned. You want to catch that for sure. Um, you know, is that graphic symbols? Within graphic symbols, you draw all and animate. Yes. Uh, but I sometimes draw it in Illustrator. I sometimes draw, you know, on paper and import that in to animate and then uh, use Onion Skin to redraw and clean up my drawings that way. Uh, that sounds insanely time-consuming to create those effects. Uh, it's not insanely time-consuming. It is really not. After a while, you just get to know. I've made every mistake there's to make, right? So um, so now when I approach things, I approach them uh, with the, the final end product in mind. All right. So here I have all these symbols. The ear, everything is separate, right? Here's the resulting animation. So we used code to have these, you know, randomly fall from the sky. Uh, it, it was uh, it was a movie clip. I converted to a graphic symbol so you could see it. If I double click, you could see all of the layers. It's a lot. So that's what it looks like. It's just kind of a forest of layers. But here's the result, which um, you know you can if you're gonna pull this basically one animation that got reused throughout the game hundreds if not thousands of times. So it's a very it's just an easy parallax effect. Uh, maybe I'll dissect this and, and like recreate it from scratch or something tonight during my stream. Um, but it's just very effective, and after a while you just get really good at it. You know, it's not that hard. It's just, you just got to think of, like, his body as a sphere and all of these other objects wrapping around it. I was playing around with actual 3D years ago, and I created a character, and I did a head turn in 3D, and I brought it into Animate as a ping sequence, an image sequence, and I realized it still looked exactly like 3D, but it was now 2D. And I said, well, why am I going into 3D to create an effect that I could actually create entirely inside of Animate as 2D? From start to finish it is just a question of, it's just an illusion so you're providing that illusion of just sliding these assets around you can see obviously anything closer to us right like the nose let's say all that will just move more and a little bit faster or at least move more in distance uh things behind in the back you see move in the opposite direction like this little hair just gets poked out you know but back in the first frame you barely see it so that is doing nothing. It's just a parallax effect using flat objects. It's just like paper cutout stuff, okay? That's all it is. Uh, you can start simple uh, and then get a little bit more complicated like this. But it worked. It totally worked. That combined with the randomized path of the uh, movie clip containing this animation falling, uh, it worked. It worked great. It didn't take long to do at all. Here's a, uh, another um, version, not so much 2.5D, but this is... Uh, character. If I double click it, you can see what comprises all of her layers and keyframes. Uh, but this is uh, Rocker Chick for a game for years ago. We basically brought uh, Guitar Hero to Facebook. Um, but this is strictly all using, you know, symbols and paper cutout style stuff. I can just turn off some layers and start turning them on. You can see all the different parts that make her and then from there it's just a question of posing creating keyframes and going from there and what I also like to do I'll show you really quick right uh, is creating um, Harris arts great to see you too is creating shadows for characters just to add some depth and there's a way to there's a couple of different ways to do that uh, inside of animate now I'm gonna do it the graphics in a way but there's also a, a, a movie clip version okay Guitar Hero to Facebook, how did I miss this? It didn't last that long, unfortunately. We spent like a year or two on it, and it was on there, and you could actually rock out socially, and it was great. Uh, you could um, it was, you'd see all other players. I think we had nine players per room, and you go on stage. And it, we even had, I spent like months just animating. Uh, you could outfit. You could choose between a male and a female character. You could outfit them in different outfits and guitars and colors and stuff like that, skin tones, you name it. And then you would see all the other rockers rocking out in real time. And if you played poorly, if you kept on missing notes, uh, I had animations that the guitarist um, would be getting frustrated and, you know, looking like throwing the hands up in the air and looking down at the guitar like it's the guitar's fault, stuff like that. Really fun. Uh, I think I might have even had one where they just smashed the guitar. Uh, which was actually, if you did really, really well, you'd smash the guitar. Um, 
Is it possible to open flash files on Animate CC? Yep, absolutely. The file extension is the same, FLA. So I'm going to show you how to do a quick and simple shadow. So I'm just going to copy this symbol. Another great thing about nesting symbols, having everything contained in one object, is you can just play around with it very easily. If I copy it, and I'm going to do it like a quick paste in place. It's not like you're really going to see what just happened. Uh, and immediately hit free transform tool, okay? I have this, I got to basically, let me just hide the first layer. Oh, this, I don't know why the center point's way down here, but I'm going to actually move it to her feet, okay? So that when I drag this, let me just show the first, I'm going to convert the top layer, the original symbol to an outline so I can see what I'm doing. This is going to become her shadow. Trust me on this. So all I'm doing is scaling this down right from the top here. And because the center points down here, it's doing what it's doing. And I'm going to skew it off to the side. And I might have to move it down so her feet kind of line up. And then if we go, uh, let's see, make sure that's selected and go to a color effect and just say tint and go to black. Now we have our shadow. And it's, it's just another instance of the same symbol. So it contains all that animation, right? There it is. So it's just in sync. That's the other thing about graphic symbols. They're in sync with the main timeline and all other graphic symbols. Everything's in sync, which if you're an animator and you're animating to say um, audio, that's extremely important, right? Movie clip, movie clips are not. Their timeline is independent. It's like a whole separate timeline from the main timeline and all other timelines. Again, it's a very dynamic object in animate. So it has its differences for sure, okay? Everything you do here works as HTML5 export. Yes, it absolutely does. It absolutely does. Does Anime CC support Google fonts for making banner creative ads? Yes, so uh, it is not on Facebook anymore. No, it's not. Long gone, long gone. It was like eight years ago. Uh, so simple. Yes, there's another way to do... Um, let me show you the movie clip way. You think that's cool. This is a way better way, too. Uh, again, I'm going to have to convert this to a movie clip. I've got... Oh, seven minutes, so we're good. Uh... To convert this to a movie clip, I select it, go up here in properties, and convert it to a movie clip, okay? So now, another thing, there's another difference about movie clips. Now, if I scrub my timeline, you're not going to see that play, right? This uh, the movie clips do not render inside the authoring uh, environment that is Animate CC. If I test this movie in the, in the Swift player, the Flash player, it will render. But as far as timing, again, inside of here, you want to be able to see how that's working. But for this effect, i got to have it be a movie clip symbol. Now, I don't have to copy and paste it onto a new layer, so let's delete that other layer. If I select it, go here. Now, movie clips support filters, something graphic symbols do not. If I go here and just say, you know what? Create a drop shadow for me. Again, it's a very flat... Yeah, let's play with the distance a little bit here. It's kind of flat, right? It's like as if she's up against a wall. Again, we can't see it play, but if I test the movie, we see it. Right, because it's a movie clip symbol. It's only going to render in here. We can also select it again and go down to strength and kind of fade it back and what, what have you. But what I want to do is do the same that I did before. Uh, let's see. Oh, you know what I wanted to do? I did, I did mess this up because I haven't done this in a while. Copy. I do want to copy and paste it. Paste it in place. And now this is what I want to do. Select it again. It's a movie clip. Grab, drop shadow, right? And here's the trick. I want to hide object, right? So now all I see is the shadow filter. And now let's make sure my center point is not going to bum me out, which it will right there. Now we skew it like we did before. So now this is really, really cool if you have a background that is way more than a solid color. I don't know if you have something with texture or what have you, like a real background that's drawn. You now, if you go here, you can apply, you can play with obviously the opacity or the strength, right? But then you can also play around with the blur, how much blur she has, or none. Now again, you can't really see that play inside of Animate, but if you test it, 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 it definitely provides you that. It has a softer, more raster kind of effect to it as a shadow. Okay. Uh, Twilight Jetty, you didn't need to take notes because uh, this, I believe, will be available as a, uh, a VOD. Okay. Yep. As Squish New just said. Um, yeah, it's kind of like magic. It's, it, it is simple, as someone just pointed out. I have always say that Animate is as complicated or as simple as you make it. It's literally a blank canvas. Uh, four minutes. Oh, I was wanted to show you this whole thing. Actually, you know what? I'm going to bypass that. I want to show you Stickman. Um, 
someone was asking me about draw, animating stick men. And it's not easy. I've been experimenting with how best to do that. Uh, and my initial um, tests were to use shape training and with all these individual strokes. This guy was drawn with the stroke tool, right? I can bend stuff like that. This is just with the line tool like this. Uh, so what I ended up doing, this is the original. Again, you guys will get access to all these files if you want. What I ended up doing was having on different layers a cup of obviously some of the limbs. I've broken down the leg into two segments and both legs, of course, the arms, two different segments. Here's the spine and his head. Okay. And I knew I was just going to keyframe this because tweening it was not working for me. I wanted to be able to bend stuff a certain way. So on this layer, I have both of his segments. Now, when I join segments, let me select a segment here that matches the same thing. Let's go to that layer. You can create segments, but if you want to snap them together, just make sure this snap to objects fe uh, feature is selected, the little magnet tool, and you'll see once you get close, it snaps. All right, now I've created a another segment and I can do that and bend stuff. Okay, so that's that layer. Same thing with this layer. It has two segments that is that leg. Here's the arm, the other arm, the spine. And so from here on out, I was able to just create keyframes. And this is a little bit labor intensive, right? But if you want to create these cool like stick figure fighting animations, this is how I did it. I had him walk across. If I would continue the walk, actually I had him stop like he saw an enemy. But if I had him continue to walk, let's delete this. Remove frames. I just go down the line, create, select that whole uh, range of layers in, in that frame. And make sure every all select all. Right. Oh, let's make sure we unlock that layer. Select all. Oh, go away icon. I accidentally opened up um, Mischief, which I sometimes use. It's a great drawing program. Anyway, I will bump everything over a few pixels, right? And then from here, bring this back, start to lift that leg a little bit, and start playing around with this. I don't want snap selected, because sometimes it'll snap these objects. So you get the idea. So that's how I animated him. So that's stick figure animation, right? Yeah, so basically what I did was I got to this point in the animation. And I'll probably continue it from there, okay? Molt it up in two minutes. Uh, let me show you some other things really quick while we have that. Uh, this was something I think I'm going to stream. Uh, a cool effect. Someone asked me in the forum, how would you create this effect of text moving around a 3D globe? That's something I can show you. This uh, image of the Earth is just a flat image I got off Google. And the text is using the 3D tool in Animate um, and in a mask and a little bit of uh, gradient, a little black gradient to, to kind of show shadow. So this is not a 3D thing at all, really. It's just all done in Animate. So I can show you guys how that's done uh, at a future broadcast. Uh, oh, and there's always this effect that I love to show because, again, it just shows you how uh, versatile uh, anime can be, where I started off with a sketch of a brush, and then from there, using uh, strokes and shape tweens on different layers, I, I wireframed it and created that basic animation, uh, brought it all down to a keyframe sequence, and it started filling it with color, gradients, really subtle gradients. I needed to create a brush effect for a game. Uh, then I started playing more around with color and then I added the brush itself and ultimately dust and things like that. So this was all done in Animate, no 3D whatsoever. So I love the fact that I can play around with Animate in so many different ways and get basically whatever I imagine, I can pull it off. And sometimes with the help of Photoshop and Illustrator, but what have you, there's, I, like I said, I've been using this program for over 16 years. I still haven't gotten bored with it just haven't. I've always found ways to kind of push myself and develop a kind of a new fun technique. So I guess I think I'm done, guys. I'm seeing the top of the hour for me. Molt is up. Please stay tuned for him. Thank you for uh, checking this whole Adobe Masterclass out. I am out. Again, I'll be back in six hours to do my regular Tuesday night stream. I appreciate you guys. Sorry if I didn't get to any questions. You can hit me up at Keyframer on Twitter and, and ask away. Thank you, guys. Stay tuned for Molt. All right. I'm out.